Welcome to the Lifestyle Builders Podcast, show three. In our last episode, we talked about building your ideal lifestyle. Today, we'll be chatting on leaving your job and becoming a full-time entrepreneur. Welcome to the Lifestyle Builders Podcast, where we bring you real-life strategies on starting and growing a business and finding financial freedom without sacrificing the life you have with your loved ones. We are your hosts, Tom and Ariana Sylvester, and we are married, we're parents, and we're serial entrepreneurs. This podcast is for those who want more out of life. We'll show you how to take the vision you have and create the business that will help you achieve it. Join us as we share practical steps, real life stories, and help you become a lifestyle builder. All right. So I don't know about you, but I'm really excited about the fact that our daughter's going to be turning six oh, this month. That's... In a couple weeks. It's not, what, it's not what a father wants to hear. What? Come on now. I know there's the sentimental, you know, they're growing older and you lose out on some of the things that they did when they were little, but you gain so many new things as they grow older and they become like little adults and yeah, tiny people, tiny people <laughs> and so much fun. But so this year she has decided poor girl has a winter birthday, so can never have like the fun outdoor birthday parties and all that stuff that her brother gets. So she gets to have indoor, but she's picked bowling. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty excited to see how a certain someone performs at the bowling alley. Our daughter? No, no. Our son? No, no. Our son. That's a laugh. <laughs> um, no, you, actually, because I wasn't around to see you bowl on TV <laughs> when you were an eight-year-old all-star bowler. Oh, man, that's that's a throwback. That is a, a huge throwback. You know what? It's probably good that, like, Facebook and the Internet and, like, <laughs> cell phones weren't around at that point because um, my bowling scale was pretty good, but my haircut... Your haircut was I, so bad. I'm not sure about that. That was, that was not the best. If you guys dig, you might be able to find some funny pictures of Tom that his sister posted in a Facebook photo war way back when. So yeah. I'm just going to leave you that tidbit. Yeah, that was bad. <laughs> but anyways, so what are we talking anyways, about today? So today we're talking about a pretty big subject here. This is a, a goal for a lot of entrepreneurs and small business owners, and it's leaving your job mm -hmm. to become a full-time entrepreneur. Yeah, and it's something that we were both able to do. Yes, after many years. <laughs> yeah. Wait, it doesn't happen in six months? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, that's what everyone tells days? you. Uh, yeah, no, it does not happen. When they want to sell you a $10,000 course. Right? Yes. Uh, it actually usually takes quite some time, uh, all dependent on your personal situation, obviously. But for most of us out there who have been able to successfully leave our jobs, it takes a lot longer than you think. So don't despair. <laughs> oh, I want to leave my job in six months. Sorry. That's, what, that's what everyone's telling me. We share difficult truths on this show sometimes. We don't like to sugarcoat things because that doesn't help anybody. So yeah, that's we're going to tell you like it is on this Lifestyle Builder show. Well, you know, and, you know, to be honest, it took us a long time. And looking back now, there was a handful of factors that caused it to take us a lot longer than, to be honest, it, should, it could take Correct. most people. Correct. Oh, and, if we were to go back, we could do it so much faster. Yeah, I mean, even just like being intentional. So there mm -hmm. were so many times where we did things that actually either weren't in line or directly went away from yep. being able to leave a job. Yep. You know, and I think over time we learned that. I mean, we made so many mistakes. Well, and we just hit upon one of the first topics I want to talk about, which is common misconceptions. <laughs> so we hit on one, which is that it happens as fast as everyone out there tells you in all the stories. Um, another very common misconception is that being your own boss is somehow easier than having a job. Yeah, you know what? Being your own boss, at least for most people, most of the people that I've coached, it's actually a lot more difficult. And I don't think people realize that. Correct. Uh, especially if um, the job that people are leaving hasn't been in like a leadership or like a management position mm -hmm. where you've been responsible, not only for yourself, but also for other people. And every single aspect of the business. Yeah, absolutely. You become, you have one job to... You have, you have many jobs. Job. You, have one, you had one job. Um, <laughs> I love those. I love those photo memes. Um, yeah, you you literally go from having like that one job, that one responsibility of the things that you cover to 
all of a sudden when you're an entrepreneur and you're running your own business, there's a certain portion of time where you are in the growth mode and you haven't yet started hiring team members and things like that. You are literally responsible for every single part of that business. Well, and I, I think that's one of the big things people don't see. And like I said, especially if you've never been in like a management or a leadership position, um, you don't really realize all the other stuff that comes with that. Um, if you have been in that type of a position, you know more of the challenges that come in because you know when you're working your job, you just have your job to worry about. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you look at a business owner, I mean, you're wearing every hat and you've got to worry about your customers. You've got to worry about getting the right product or service. You've got to worry about, do I have enough cash coming in? Yep. Um, you know, if you end up having employees, you know, are you able to pay them? I mean, there's so much that I think most people don't realize when you go and start your own business that you're now responsible. Well, and for. it's you're responsible for the things that you're not good at, whether you want to be or not. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest, when you have a job, a lot of times you're doing a job of, of something that you're already good at. You either went to school for it or you excel at a certain skill and that company hired you for that skill. When you're a business owner, you have to do all of those things. Um, you know, especially if you're bootstrapping it and you don't have a lot of funding, you can't just go and outsource stuff and hire stuff out to other people. You're responsible for doing all of it, well, whether you're say, good at it or not. Related to that, one of the things I always tell people is part of being an entrepreneur is you got to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's a big part that separates people that are successful, which aren't, is, you know, are you willing to do those things that are tough or challenging or maybe you're going to expose you or stretch you? Mm -hmm. And that's an ongoing thing. I mean, everyone should be doing that, but especially especially as an entrepreneur, it's like things are like fireballs are just going to be coming at you and you got to be able to, to deal with that. Otherwise, you're going to crash and burn. Yeah. And, and the last one, which is the one that I don't want to say it scares me, but it does make me concerned because when people talk about leaving their jobs, it's normally you have to build up a business to cover your your income that you are bringing home with a paycheck. So yep. they say, oh, well, I make three thousand dollars a month so all i need to do is go and make three thousand dollars in my business yeah. to, for me to bring home and i'm good and it is honestly it is a little scary because that is not at all not, no, not, not even how it works and you know it also depends highly on what type of business you choose so you know often you'll see like freelancers going out and they don't have a lot of expenses in their business so they do get to bring home a lot of the money that they make. But one thing that a lot of entrepreneurs forget about is you have to pay taxes. So they fall into the trap of thinking I get to bring home every dollar that I make. And then when tax time comes around and their business owes the government money, where does that money come from? Well, it comes back out of your pocket because if you didn't set it aside, now you've got a problem. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say, as you were getting into that, that reminds me of a blog post that I wrote. Of course it does. Um, yeah. <laughs> It's either a book or a blog <laughs> post, right? <laughs> and um, in that blog post, I forget the title, but it was like, you know, what it really means or what it really looks like to be um, a six-figure entrepreneur or something like that. And that's really the key is, you know, there's different, like when you get your paycheck, you get to, like, you don't see a lot of the stuff that gets taken out and you get to just spend that paycheck. But as an entrepreneur, when a client pays you, you don't get to keep all that money. There's uh, business expenses, there's taxes, um, you know, there's even, uh, so most entrepreneurs don't realize your employer actually pays part of your taxes and so, your health insurance and your health insurance. So when you become self-employed, you're now actually paying more of those taxes and your health insurance and other things. So as a result of that, you've got to really understand the numbers and make sure that it's not just replacing my income, but you want to get all those other factors and figure out what is the actual number that I need to make, um, to then allow myself to take the three thousand dollars home yeah um a quick rule of thumb and actually uh, we put a whole uh webinar actually a workshop mm -hmm. out on this called find your freedom so yep. we'll link to that in the show notes at tom and ariana dot com slash three <laughs> forgot that for a second didn't you? yeah our names totally very very difficult <laughs> But, um, but anyways, so we did a whole workshop on kind of walking through each of those steps and how to figure that out. Um, but a simple way, just kind of rule of thumb, whatever you're bringing home now, double that, and that's what your business has to make in order for you to kind of stay at that le same level. Yep. Um, and I, let's, let's, let's turn the tables quickly because I don't want to scare everyone away from 
trying to build a business and trying to become an entrepreneur because it is actually a really, really rewarding thing to do. We just don't want you to fall into the trap of thinking that it's easy and that it happens fast. So let's just pick some of our favorite things uh, that have happened or that we now get to enjoy because we're full-time entrepreneurs. Oh, absolutely. I mean, my first one was I always said that when our daughter started kindergarten, I wanted to be able to be there. And our first day, like we were there with her in the morning and years before I was like flying to different cities and being gone. So I was there in the morning. We got to take pictures. We put her on the bus. We went to her school. We got to see her teacher and her classmates. And like, that was something that I could have never done years before when I had a job. Mm -hmm. For me, I think it's been the ability to create my own every day, as we talked about yeah. on the last show. And obviously it's not it's not quite yet what I want my own every day to be, but we are getting closer and closer. And the fact that I get to wake up and if one of our kids is homesick for the day, I can just take the day off. Yeah. I can work on my laptop from the couch. I can go and have lunch with a friend if I'm feeling off and I need some some time away. Well, I was going to say, how weird is it when we like go to the movies in the middle yes. of the day? Yes, well, that's or, one of or, our put us that's one of our put ourselves first things that we we used to be huge movie buffs. Uh, we have a theater in our basement, so it <laughs> obviously was something we spent a lot of time on. And obviously once we had kids that cut down a little bit and now that we've got, you know, the businesses and we're always doing something either with the kids in the business, we let it go way too much that we didn't spend enough time together and we weren't doing the things that we enjoyed. So um, that's one of our our promises to ourselves is to start putting ourselves first again. So we've started getting back into the gym, getting back in shape. We've uh, we've been really good with our meal planning and meal prepping so that we're eating healthy and we have stuff that we actually like to eat during the week. And then our last one was actually going out, like leaving the house and doing things non-business related. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So we put aside um, afternoons because as parents, obviously, sometimes evenings are hard if we don't find a babysitter or send the kids off to grandma's. Uh, So, yeah, we're going to do movie afternoons, like crazy matinees on (laughs) a Tuesday afternoon and go and find something we want to see and just go see it. Yeah, well, and to your point, like, so the overarching theme here is that you have more control and you get to create that ideal every day. Mm -hmm. And that's what you don't have if you're working a job. I mean, there's some flexibility with some jobs, but um, you don't have that control. Um, But with that control also comes the flip side of that, which is making sure that you're responsible and that you can manage yourself. Exactly. So that brings us to what we see as the three biggest struggles when you transition from working a job to becoming that full-time entrepreneur. And um, I'll talk to the first one because I was the one to leave my job first. The hardest thing was I was alone all day long. And I actually enjoy being alone sometimes. I am an only child, so I was quite used to it from just being younger. And I didn't always have people around, so I got used to doing things on my own. But to be alone all the time was a huge change. I felt like I never talked to people (laughs) I adult interaction. What was that? that? When I go to the grocery store, I'd be like talking to the checkout lady because she was the only person (laughs) that I had talked to all day, you know, or I would go to the pick up our son at daycare and I'd be like chatting away with the teachers (laughs) because I'm like, I need to talk to somebody. So that transition of being around people, like just to chat for five minutes and then go back to work to all of a sudden you're sitting by yourself all day was a really big shift. And then, um, I do well when I know what I'm supposed to be doing and I have someone to like tell me what I'm supposed to be doing. So going from having a boss to say, hey, you got to get this, this, this and this done today to I'm free. I have all day (laughs) was like I felt so unproductive some days. Well, it kind of goes back to the first thing you said about like being your own boss and how good that is. But there are downsides to that. And one of them is like, you know, having to be accountable for yourself and figure all of that out. And um, actually, when we launched Lifestyle Builders, our community, uh, one of the things that a lot of people kept saying, like the number one thing that kept coming up was that I need accountability. I need someone to poke, watch over my shoulder and poke me when I'm getting off track. Yeah. And I mean, like even um, some of the coaching clients that I've had, like, you know, one of them, I, I loved when he said this, he's like, you know, Tom, all due respect, 
I'm not coming to you for what you know. Like I, I know a lot of things that maybe I know more than you. What I'm coming for you is to keep me accountable because what I'm struggling with is to take everything I know in my head and to actually make it work. And I've had a career and I'm used to kind of that environment. And it's been a big challenge to then work through it, especially alone, yep. especially when things don't work. Yeah. Right. Because we don't have that outside perspective to be able to see it, to be able to ask the questions and to know that like, oh, crap, I'm going to have to tell somebody else I didn't do this. I better make sure I do it. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I'm with you on that one. Uh, the next struggle I want to chat on is is one that so, so many people go through. And it's that feast or famine mode of oh my God, I've got all the clients and I'm making all the money to, oh no, everyone's contract is over and now I have no money <laughs> yeah. and this is horrible. Why did I do this? Yeah. Well, and that comes back to the the money and the finances we talked about before. The benefits of having a job is you're, you're used to that consistent income. And guess what? Even if the company you're working for has a bad time, they probably have money to float it. And guess what? You're still getting a paycheck. Yeah. But with you, when you own your own business, like you're in complete control of that, which means that if you neglect some of this stuff, you may not have that paycheck coming in. And it could be very tough to go from the highs and the lows mm -hmm. of, hey, I just made a whole bunch of money to, hey, suddenly clients aren't renewing. Or here's, here's a big one. I did a bunch of sales and marketing. I got a bunch of new clients or customers. So then I spent stopped all my time sales and marketing. helping them and stopped doing sales and marketing. And then when they left, I had to like start sales and marketing again. And that's a tough cycle to it go through. It is. Well, and the same thing for, for offline. I mean, just look at our one of our businesses, our wine and liquor store. There are busy seasons where we make the large majority of our money. Yep. And then there are off parts of the season where yeah, it trickles in. We have kind of consistent sales. But during those times, it's really, really not as much as those popular times. So it's like you have to balance that as well and trying to go and, and figure out how to do that off the bat is it can be really tough well i was gonna say and what we've looked at with each of our businesses like you mentioned our wine and liquor store um actually looking at what do we what can we offer how do we supplement those busy times like how do we make sure that the slow times we're doing something different to continue to get sales in. So we've got some cool stuff that we're doing this year to make sure that during those slower seasons, we've got different offers, we're targeting different markets. So there's a lot of stuff you can do there, but it starts with understanding basically your business model and how it's going to work and then figuring out where are some of the risks and how can you mitigate those? Yep. Yeah. And uh, the last one, we obviously, we obviously, honestly, we already <laughs> touched upon it. My words will happen today, I swear. Um, so Tom talked a little bit about having a boss and like someone to be accountable to, but also the support system is a huge, huge struggle when you go. It's not just about being lonely. Like, obviously, that's that's its own thing. But to do everything that's needed as an entrepreneur to to run your business, to learn and do the development pieces of it, to do all the parts that need to, that's needed to grow the business. Um, and a lot of that includes so, so many emotions and oh, mindset yeah. changes and all of these things you have to go through that if you don't have a solid support system around you can very, very easily cause you to not be able to do it or to give up. Yeah. Because it's just, it is a roller coaster. It's nuts. I mean, <laughs> I, so many, I'm an emotional person. So I, all of you out there, all you emotional people, it's even worse for us because we already felt those emotions and now they're heightened times a hundred. Um, but even for Tom, you know, I know that we both went through different stages Absolutely. As we've been growing where, you know, you're having a lot more of the the need for support. And we kind of like swap. We kind of swapped that back and forth. And any time where we both needed support was when we were really in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and that's the thing, too. You know, a lot of people like one of my favorite quotes is, you know, you're the, the sum or the average of the five people that you surround yourself with. And for a lot of people that go from the change of I'm working a job to now I'm going to be an entrepreneur, oftentimes you the people around you also had jobs mm -hmm. and so when you suddenly start shift and you become different it's sometimes the sometimes they want to hold you back because they're jealous or they're afraid and they don't want you to step out and have success sometimes they're just genuinely concerned about yep. you but either way they're likely not going to give you the support and the encouragement like a successful entrepreneur would mm -hmm. to say look 
I'm going to be real with you. You can make this happen, but it's going to be tough along the way. And these are the things or these are the times where you're going to need support to get through it. Well, and even surrounding yourself with people that are at, at the same level as you, because then you've got you've got a, a group of people and that camaraderie and that like people are like, oh, I just went through this. Like, you're going to be fine. Do this, this and this. It totally helped me. Like, that's that's sort of what you need in well, that time. I was going to say a cool thing that we're seeing in like our lifestyle builders private community is someone will come in and they'll they'll post like a loss or a challenge. They're like, guys, I went and did this and like nobody did anything. And then either us or somebody else will chime in and say something and they go and do it. And then the next day, they're like, I did it. I, I win. Yeah. Like, I mean, even yesterday, so I was on the call with one of our one of our um, lifestyle builders actually had like a big call that she was potentially going to close. And so we, we jumped on a call very quick beforehand, gave her some confidence, gave her some guidance. And she initially was going to like pass this off to somebody else because she didn't think she could do it. We got on the call and then like 20 minutes later, she's like, I closed a deal. It was like $1,500 a month contract. Yeah. So just amazing how a little bit of support and a little bit of outside like you can do it and I'm here for you can completely change your mindset and your ability to have that success. Yeah. So let's 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 continue on this route. How do we overcome these struggles that we just talked about Obviously, we we skipped ahead a little bit. We were talking more about how to overcome that accountability. I, I accountability, that. And you do a lot. Accountability and support struggle is to go out and find a support system for yourself. Uh, that could be other groups of entrepreneurs, whether it's in like a Facebook group or an online community, or even if it's in your local community. There's a ton of entrepreneur groups that get together locally, different times of the year, quarter, week. I mean, some of them meet all the time. So if you can find a core group of people that you can just meet up with for coffee every once in a while and keep in touch and email back and forth and you have that support system of those people that are going through it with you. Well, and know what's cool is, you know, locally, if you have people in person, that's awesome. But some people are maybe in a small town. Like we came from small towns. We're in a little bit bigger city now, but it may be hard to find people locally. Mm -hmm. But I mean, with the internet, like with Facebook groups, like we have our Facebook group for family entrepreneurs. Um, there's so many ways to connect and find people that are like you or that you like being around and then getting on video calls. Like it's, it takes that barrier of not being in the same location. Yep. It takes the majority of it away. And then what's cool is that you might actually meet some of those people in real life. Like we've met a lot of people online and we felt like we knew each other. And then like a year later, we would meet in real life at a conference. Uh -huh. And then it just builds those bonds and those connections so much more. Yeah. Well, and the same thing. So I know there's a lot of people out there as they become entrepreneurs, they find it really tough because their family doesn't understand and their friends don't understand. But very often you will have people who will stick by you while you're doing that transition. So take advantage of that. If you've got family supporting you, if you've got friends supporting you, keep them clued in to what you're doing so that they understand when you come and are, are like depressed and you're down and something didn't work, even if they don't exactly know what your business is about, they can still be there for you and talk to you and kind of walk you through it. Um, just as a family member or a friend, like someone who's close to you and that cares for you. Well, and, and related to that, so, you know, we talked a little bit last time about kind of setting your roadmap and setting some goals. The other thing, too, is to really get clear on what your goals are and what you want to do, let's say, in the next 90 days, and then use that to guide what you do. And, you know, we talked about setting your check-in points and setting your schedule. If you really set all of that up, what it then forces you to do is to focus on the right things mm -hmm. and push a lot of the other stuff to the side. Because a lot of times when you can get overwhelmed too is when you don't know what you have to do next or you're not sure, like, are you on track? Are you ahead? Are you behind? So by doing that, plus having the support in place, you can let them know your intentions. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, guy, like we do an accountability thread every week, right? Yep. So put your accountabilities, what you want to achieve this week, and then we'll help support each other to make sure we do it. And that combination is lethal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You were starting to skip ahead of me on a little bit again, but it's okay. I won't call you. I will call you out, actually. I was going to say, uh, you be better honest. get used to it because after 12 years, it's not going to change. <laughs> it's not, is it 12? It's 15. Yeah. 
Definitely 15. I don't know. It's somewhere. <laughs> it's it's 9 to 15, so if I'm anywhere <laughs> in that range, it's probably good. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about how you overcome the working from home struggles of being lonely, of not having a boss. So we talked about that a little bit already with the accountability and support. Find other people to talk to. If you don't have anyone locally, jump on coffee chats with other entrepreneurs. As Tom said, just do like a Skype or a Zoom call so that it actually feels like you're sitting across the table from someone. It's just across the computer. And just talk to people and make sure you've got some of that scheduled throughout your week so that you're not home alone all week long, head down working. Go out to lunch with a friend or go meet your spouse for lunch if they're still working a job. Go well, to lunch and meet with your kids at school. Well, I was going to say, and this is where a co-working space yes. might come in well. So we do some virtual co-working with people to kind of get a little bit of that. But you might have a co-working space in your city where you can pay for um, a monthly membership. And what you do is basically you go there and work, but other people who are either working from home or other on entrepreneurs are there as well and it just lets you be around other people get out of your house and sometimes just changing that environment makes a big difference yeah and as far as the not having a boss struggle the best thing that I've found is to set a schedule for yourself um, honestly I know a lot of people don't like working with schedules but it can be as loose or as rigid as you want it to be or need it to be um, but just say like okay from this time to this time that's my working time then I'm going to have a lunch break. Then from this time to this time, I'm going to work some more. If you like to sleep in, let yourself sleep in and then just work later. Um, obviously, if you have kids, it might not be allowable because <laughs> ours like to wake up at 530 in the morning. Um, but like my prime work time is at night after the kids have gone to bed. Obviously, I work throughout the day. But then when I want to get a little bit extra done, I'll sit on the couch usually and just do a little bit more for my laptop. Tom's an early morning person. So you don't have to do exactly what you did at your job, but sometimes having that set schedule actually works better for you than just being like, oh, I have the entire day to do whatever I want. Yeah, well, and I have a lot of like creative people that come and say, Tom, I can't set the schedule. It's going to limit me. Um, but after like we work with them, we kind of show them, you set that schedule the way you want. And what that allows you to do is it actually allows you to be more creative mm -hmm. because otherwise yeah. you might try to be creative all the time and then you might not prioritize some of the important stuff that maybe isn't creative but you need to do. But by blocking out times, like some people just block out, here's my creative day, here's my non-creative day or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but for other people, like there's some days where I'll block out like every hour specifically what I'm going to do just so I can do it. But then there's other days like, Thursday. Thursday is my training and content creation day. So I don't book anything specifically throughout that day, but I know that's my focus. Mm -hmm. So it can be very freeing and it can make sure that you're being intentional with the time that you spend. Yep. And the other thing is too, if you, if you're someone who works well with like a deadline, I know a lot of people are like, oh, I got to get this done by this time because my boss said it has to be handed in or whatever. If you're good at working like that, give yourself deadlines or mm -hmm. have someone else give you deadlines. Maybe have an accountability partner. You keep each other on track and say, hey, I need to get this done. And they can say, well, you need to have it done by Friday and I'm going to check in on you so that you've got that like somebody's peeking over your shoulder and making sure you get it done. You're feeling that pressure a little bit because it's an important task. Well, I was going to say, so even when we do like the guided co-working sessions, mm -hmm. we use a technique called the Pomodoro. And basically what that is, is you're setting mini deadlines. So the common way is to set a 25 minute chunk of time. Mm -hmm. And your deadline is, this is what I'm going to have done in 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then you give yourself a break and you do it again. So some people say 25 minutes is too small. But after people do it, they're like, I can't believe how much I just got done. Yeah. I think or it depends you can, on you, and it also depends on what you're trying to do. Well, and you can also shift it to like 50 minutes. Yep. So you do 50 minutes dedicated time, 10 minutes off. But the key thing is, is that you're setting, to your point, those targets, yep. and then you're focusing. And once you focus, it's amazing how much you get done. It really is. Um, and, yeah, I think that's – those are the two biggest things for me was like setting a schedule and then giving – important or urgent tasks a deadline like i need to have this done well and, this and just jump on that quick so you talked about urgent and important and actually this is a key thing we talk about in our plan with purpose course um around how to prioritize and what tends to happen is that people always get caught up in the urgent stuff mm -hmm. and sometimes the urgent stuff may not be important but it pushes all the important stuff to the side so it's important <laughs> no pun intended to make sure that you know you're really looking at getting the important things done 
and then filling in the urgent stuff with that as well. You know, and the urgent things that aren't important, those are actually the things you want to delegate or get somebody to help you with mm-hmm. so that you can focus on the most important things. Yeah. And that brings us to our last struggle, which is the feast and famine. And there are a couple ways that you can try to lessen the feast and famine cycles or at least lessen the gap between them. Um, one of them is getting super clear on your offers and your ideal clients. Uh, A lot of people tend to put offers out and go and look for clients and you kind of just take whatever work comes in if you're in a feast or a famine mode because you don't have a lot of client work. So you're like, oh, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, I'll do that. What happens, though, is that actually doesn't align with you and your business because those if they're not your ideal clients, they're actually causing more work for you or causing more of a struggle because you don't work well together or the project isn't really aligned with what your offer was or any number of reasons. And that actually doesn't help you in the long run. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, so if you had, let's say, um, an assembly line or you're at like a, a restaurant and if you're just making one thing, it's then easy just to keep repeating that. But if you go from making a pizza to making sub to making a steak, you've got to constantly change up the setup and it's going to take so much longer and you're not going to be as good. And guess what? People aren't going to come to your restaurant if you're making subs and a steak like in the same window. So this is really where niching down and honing in on that. If you make subs and you've got a handful of ways that you do it, you've got three main subs, now all you're doing is making those three main subs, you're going to be known for those, you're going to be good at them, and you're not constantly switching around to all these other things. Yeah, and if someone comes to your window and orders something else, you don't just say, sure, I'll make that for you. You say, that's not what I do. And it takes. And if you say, sure, I'll make that, it sounds good because you're getting money, but it's ultimately taking you away from those ideal clients, and it causes so many more challenges later on. Yeah, and part of it you talked about as well was, going through those feast and famine cycles actually a lot of times is because people are going through the selling and marketing cycle and then they stop doing it when they have enough clients. One of the toughest pieces is how to keep doing that when you're busy with client work. So that's where it really comes in with what are your offers and who are you trying to offer that to so that you can set things in motion to stay in motion while you're while you've got clients and while you're fully booked that is still out there that you're still having you've scheduled all your social media posts or you have an email list and you have emails going out you've got people on a waiting list for when you are um, back open for business or whatever it is you're not just leaving it and doing nothing for those couple months while you've got booked fully booked clients you've got stuff out there in the universe saying come come work with me so that when you are back open you don't have to work so hard to find those ideal clients to come in and and work with yeah i mean when i work with coaching clients so just very quick this is what i take them through early on in your business most of your time should be spent selling and marketing and part of that is going to be validating your idea and making sure that people will buy it and then as you start getting people to buy it part of your time then has to shift into operations where you're actually delivering what you're selling Um, so what tends to happen with the feast and famine is we do a lot of selling, then we get a lot of that, the delivery that we got to do, but we don't do the selling. So what I work with a lot of people on is as we start getting those sales, putting the right systems, processes, and even a team in place so that you're still spending time in the areas you need to, and you're not neglecting them. And that's where most people end up hitting kind of, um, a rut where they get to a certain point and then they've got to add better systems or better processes or even hire people in to be able to grow because there's only so much they can do. Yeah. yeah. So I'm sure we'll do another episode on that because that oh, itself sure is just a, a huge topic. Of course. That sounds like a Tom topic <laughs> submission. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So your homework for this episode is to go out and figure out what your freedom number is. To leave your job. So what's a freedom number? That's a great question, Tom. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> asking it. Your freedom number is the actual number, the actual income number that you need to bring home from your business in order to successfully leave your job. So it would cover all your expenses. It would cover any new expenses um, that come in, obviously, like paying for insurance or whatnot. Um, and you've gone and figured out the actual number that you need based on how taxes would change and all, all of those 
All of those little things. And that's going to come into play if you go back and watch our Find Your Freedom Well, that's workshop. what I was going to say. Yeah, it we does actually explain walked... it more in depth in there and show you pictures. Yeah, absolutely. So um, related to that, my homework, once you get done with Ariana's homework, is then to figure out how much your business needs to be making for you to do that. And this is going to be pretty easy. <laughs> Take the number you come up with with Ariana. <laughs> Don't and give them the double answer. It. Shh. Double it. So this is going to give you a starting point, just so you know. Like we said earlier, if you want to bring three thousand home, target initially to make six thousand in your business, and then I'll let you bring three home. And we'll we'll talk about this in a future episode. But part of this is using a concept called profit first. There's a whole book and a whole system on that. But we use it just as a guideline to understand how big does your business have to be to allow you to have that freedom or leave your job or whatever that is. Yep. And of course, as always, we will link to everything we've talked about in this episode, any workshops or books or any extra resources in the show notes page at tomandariana.com slash three. All right. We are to our Tom's book self series. I love this segment. What book do you have for us today? All right. So the book for today, you probably heard about it. If you haven't, you've been living under a rock. It's called <laughs> Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And this is, I mean, this is probably one of the classic books that everybody recommends. And the reason I'm, I'm talking about this book today is the, the main concept is Robert Kiyosaki, the guy who wrote this, had what he called uh, his poor dad, which was his real dad who worked a job, made a lot of money, um, but ended up not really having a lot of wealth. And then he had what he calls his rich dad was his friend's father. And he basically just shares the different principles and philosophies to understand, like, how do you really build wealth? And for a lot of people, like just one example of this was how you define an asset and a liability. Mm -hmm. And so this sounds like very boring, like, you know, banking terms. But so what he does is normally a bank will say, Anything of value is an asset. So your car is an asset. Your house is an asset. But what he does is he reframes this and says an asset is something that makes you money. And just by thinking about things that way, what you suddenly look at is say, well, my car actually takes money every month because i got to pay on a loan or I've got to put maintenance on it. My house actually is a liability because I don't. it doesn't make me money. So it starts reframing how you think and getting you, I'd say, into more of an entrepreneurial mindset, which is going to be the first step to actually allowing you to leave your job or have that freedom. So right. rich dad, poor dad. All right. That's the book of <laughs> Tom's bookshelf for this for this episode, everyone. Uh, it's been another great episode with Tom and Ariana, your hosts and lifestyle builders. And I want you guys to remember, it's your life, your business, your way. Bye. We'll see you next week. Are you frustrated by a lack of momentum in your business? Do you want real-time guidance and support from seasoned entrepreneurs who really care about your results? If you're nodding your head or awkwardly shouting yes in public somewhere, then we invite you to join Lifestyle Builders, a mentorship program designed to meet you where you are and give you strategic and custom guidance so you can build the business you need for the life you crave. You can find out more at joinlifestylebuilders.com. Your life, your business, your way. We join family entrepreneur life. We join family entrepreneur life. That was from Daily Bumps. Did you get it?